How are you guys? My name is Timon, I'm 19 years old and from Germany. Welcome to Digital Damage Control, where I want to educate about how to use social media, internet and tech in a healthy way. With you together I want to find answers to modern society problems. As you already saw in the thumbnail, this video is about a comparison between the Play Store and the Fdroid Store, a privacy respecting app store. I've been using Fdroid for almost two years now and I want to share my experience with you guys as well as the research I've done on this topic. Is it worth your attention? Let's find out. The Play Store as we know it today was founded in 2008. It was developed and backed by the company, who would have thought, Google Inc, which changed its name and legal status to Google LLC in 2017. The Fdroid Store was founded in 2010 by Fdroid LTD, a non-profit organization that doesn't operate under a single entity, but outsources tasks to different companies and private individuals. When the Play Store was released, Google already had major success with their search engine and various other products. In fact, they were so successful that they became the world's most valuable company in 2007. Fdroid on the other side started with one person's idea of a free, libre and open source app store with a focus on privacy and security. So in the beginning the Play Store had much more resources it could benefit from. Having bought Android Inc. in 2005 it helped rolling the product out for the masses in 2008. Besides the app store from Apple, it was the only store that could maintain dominating the market of mobile devices. Because obviously both companies only allowed their own app stores to come pre-installed on their operating system. Today Google LLC to which the Play Store belongs is one of 13 main subsidiaries that are managed by Alphabet Inc, a holding company that founders of Google created in order to be more attractive to investors. It took Fdroid a couple of years to become relevant and spark general interest. Edward Snowden's disclosures in 2013 regarding global surveillance programs made the public aware of how serious they needed to actually take the protection of their privacy. Searching for privacy-friendly alternatives to mainstream digital services, the Fdroid Store caught the attention of people. The Google Play Store offers a variety of different services and products. When you open the home page, five different categories pop up. Those are apps, movies and TV, music, books and devices. Of the mentioned categories, Google LLC makes the most revenue through Android applications. The source of income are app and in-app purchases. App purchases occur when you pay to download the apps. In-app purchases are fees you can pay after you already downloaded the app itself. There are endless options how this could be applied. You can pay for game add-ons, premium features, subscriptions and more. From the total revenue made in this category, Google LLC keeps 30%. The music and podcast streaming service Google Play Music that soon will be replaced by YouTube Music, gains revenue by selling albums, single tracks, by offering free music podcast stream with ads and subscription-based streaming without ads. They keep between 60 and 70% of the revenue. Google Play Movies and TV is a video on demand service. You can rent or buy a movie, series and television shows. Streaming isn't possible. Google's answer to other video streaming services is YouTube Premium. Google Play Movies and TV targets specifically services as Amazon Prime that also lets you buy and rent movies. I could not find any numbers to how much percent Google pays off to movie companies and TV stations. The ebook digital distribution service Google Play Books lets you buy and download ebooks as well as audiobooks. They pay authors and publishers 52% of the revenue. Under specific conditions it is possible to get 70% of the revenue but only in America, Canada and Australia. Last but not least we have the devices. You get redirected to the Google Play Store when you press on the category. It basically is the online store of Google's hardware like for example the Google Pixel Phone, Chromecast Streaming Stick or the Nest Smart Home System. Because all products get licensed by Google themselves, 100% of the revenue stays in the company. Google LLC also makes profit of the Play Store indirectly through other services, for example their app monetization tool called Google AdMob. This advertising tool probably makes the same amount as the in-app purchases, app purchases and other Play Store media combined. Advertising included in apps can pop up in many different formats, as banner, interstitial, rewarding video and native. Other services 
that take advantage of the Play Store popularity are the already mentioned YouTube ads, YouTube Premium subscription and YouTube Music. The F-Droid Store's only service includes providing app downloads. They are not based on advertising, subscription and sale model. Instead they rely on donations and volunteers that keep maintaining and developing the platform. What is the difference between revenue and profit? Revenue is the total amount of income generated by the goods or services a company sells and does not include expenses. Profit is the income that remains after accounting for the expenses. The latest statistics show the gross app revenue generated on the Play Store in 2018. 24.2 billion US dollars was the amount of money all app developers made together in that year. Because Google keeps 30% of the revenue made through app and in-app purchases, their app revenue for the year 2018 was about 7.4 billion US dollars. Unfortunately, the revenue for Google Play Music, Google Play Movies and TV, Google Play Books and Devices are not listed separately in Google's annual report. Instead, they are only mentioned under the total income of the Play Store. I also couldn't find other reliable statistics on the revenue of these services. Together with the app revenue and YouTube non-advertising including YouTube Premium and YouTube TV subscriptions and other services, Google Play generated around 17 billion US dollars in 2019. Because the app revenue stats are from 2018, let's say the Google Play Store app revenue also had an increase of 27.3% from 2018-2019 as they had from 2017 to 2018. That would mean that they made a revenue of around 9 billion US dollars from app purchases and in-app purchases. Now we can subtract the 9 billion from the 17 billion US dollars. That would mean that Google made 8 billion US dollars on the other categories, excluding the apps. Is that everything? Nope. We still need the number for mobile advertising, revenue and YouTube ad revenue. The YouTube ad revenue is easy to figure out. There is an extra category for that. About 15 million US dollars was the YouTube ad revenue in 2019. The AdsMob revenue, Google's tool for mobile app monetization, is again more complicated. It is listed under the main category Google Network Members Proprietaries, which also includes advertisement, revenue from Google AdSense and Google Ad Manager. Together they made 21 billion US dollars in 2019. But how much is now the mobile ad revenue? Let's say all three of these services, Google AdMob, AdSense and Ad Manager, make the equal amount of money. That would mean a revenue of 7 billion US dollars per service. From the annual report we know that AdSense revenue decreased over the course of the last two years and that both Ad Manager and AdMob increased in value. So we could estimate that AdMob makes about 9 billion US dollars. So directly Google Play revenue is 17 billion US dollars. Indirectly, Google profits from the Google Play Store's user base through their advertisement and may lay at around 24 billion US dollars. F-Droid's last annual report shows us that they had assets of 11,000 British pounds, that's about 14,000 US dollars. As you can state by now, F-Droid's intention is not to generate as much money as possible from users, but to provide a standard for secure and privacy-friendly apps. This standard should be taken for granted in 2020 but the digital market is very mature and developed. Unfortunately, this isn't the case. It's alarming that f LTD manages to apply important privacy and security standards with 14,000 US dollars donations made per year, whereas Google LLC fails drastically with an income of 17 billion US dollars only made through the Google Play Store directly. And the much bigger user base Google provides its services to puts the company in an even much, much higher position of responsibility. You could even argue that Google is the reason why a real standard for privacy and security does still not exist in the app space today. But let's look at the scale on which the Play Store is operating. Over 3 million apps currently exist on the Play Store, compared to the 3,300 apps on the F-Droid Store. I think we can all agree that nobody could possibly ever have 3 million apps installed on his smartphone. Stats show that the average user has between 90 and 100 apps on his mobile device and that the number of apps used per month lies by around 30 to 40. Even having multiple apps that serve the same purpose and offer a different approach, you still don't need that many. Compared to the apps you actually use, even 3,300 of them are a lot. The question arises if the Play Store can ensure a virus-free application at this huge scale. The answer is simple, they can't. They can make sure that apps with viruses are held by a minimum 
But what is the minimum at a number of 3 billion apps? Still a lot. How the Play Store and Android Store monitor the apps I will explain now. Google Play's policy and guidelines cover 11 main categories with a total of 38 subcategories. The main categories are restricted content, impersonation and intellectual property, privacy, security and deception, monetization and ads, store listing and promotion, spam and minimum functionality, other programs, families, enforcement, updates and resources, and how Google Play works for developers. In theory, this might seem as if Google actually cared about your privacy and security. We deeply care about the privacy and security of our users. But looking into how the Play Store is run, I would question that. If Google really was motivated to focus on the privacy of users, they would encourage apps with none or only one tracker. Trackers collect information on how good an app works on your device, but also can send personal user data to the company even if you didn't log into an account. The more trackers are embedded in the code, the more companies collect your data and the chance gets higher that you get spied on. The top apps on the Play Store include a lot of trackers. To prove this point, I looked up how many trackers the first 14 of them had. Please be aware that the top list may be displayed differently depending on the country you live in and the time you watch this video. Of 14 apps, only 2 had no trackers at all. 5 had 1 to 4 trackers and 7 had up to 11 trackers. Adding all the trackers together, there were 61 trackers found in 14 apps. This makes an average of over 4 trackers per app. Maybe you could say that Google can't influence which apps are top listed, but to a certain extent they do. When you search for an app, those with a lot of trackers tend to show up first before showing apps with less trackers. That of course has an impact on how often the app gets downloaded. What you can't deny is that Google has control of which apps get recommended to you as a user. So I did the same thing here. I looked up how many trackers the for me recommended apps have. It turns out that only one app had no trackers. Four apps had up to four trackers and nine apps had up to 50 trackers. Adding the trackers up, we have 92 trackers for 14 apps. This makes an average of over 6 trackers per app. So the apps Google recommended to me had an even higher tracker per app ratio. This shows you that Google does not make any efforts to focus on the privacy of users. Our utmost care is ensuring privacy and security of our users. The general practice on the Play Store is the more trackers, especially having the Google ones, the more revenue, the more popularity on the store. Apps that only do what they should and respect the user's privacy get buried under apps that don't. The concept that apps also can improve their user experience over time without using any trackers gets proven when you look at the top apps on the Android store. You don't have a section for that, but on the German Wikipedia page a list of the most popular Android apps can be found. Surprise surprise, of the 22 listed apps, only 4 had trackers at all. With 4 trackers for 22 apps, the average of trackers per app lies by 0.18. And the app search is transparent. You get what you searched for. As the guidelines of the Android store say, they quote, cannot build apps using proprietary track and analytic dependencies, like Crashlytics and Firebase, end quote. So you won't find any app with Google trackers on the Android store. Tech companies like Google have a lot of sensible data about you. Using this data for the wrong motivation can cause big damage. That's why their reputation is so important. So I searched for the biggest Google scandals and controversies concerning privacy in the last three years that were covered by the news. Google plans to launch censored search engine in China. Google records your location data even when you tell it not to. Google cuts secret deal with Mastercard to track offline sales. Google built a custom search engine for China that would provide authorities with phone numbers for users searching for banned topics. Google says it continues to allow apps to scan data from Gmail accounts. Google suppresses Memo, revealing plans to closely track search users in China. Google exposed user data, feared repercussion of disclosing to public. FU leakers. A former senior Google employee says a frantic quest to stop internal info getting out is now management's number one priority. Google confirms that it has been collecting personal health data on millions of patients. Google does not only collect data from its services, but actively buys sensible user data from companies like Mastercard. Mastercard is known for its debit, credit and prepaid cards that get used worldwide. When Google makes a mistake like exposing your data, they consider their image being more important than its users. They contribute to the surveillance of totalitarian governments as China instead of resisting their demands. Yes, they would maybe lose market, but they would set a sign that they value human rights over money. 
On Fdroid, I could not find any scandals or controversies concerning privacy. I only found in Reddit discussion about the question how secure Fdroid is and a news article from Pro Privacy asking the same question. All that was said in the end was that Fdroid does a lot to not collect data and that the Fdroid store is really secure. What do we learn? Google isn't trustworthy when it comes to your data. and They have access to more. Fdroid is trustworthy and does not make attempts to collect your data at all. Play Store apps are not as slick and lightweight as on the Fdroid store. You get more functions than you need, so they also take up more storage. They also produce more data and cache. That can slow your phone down over time. So using Play Store apps increases your mobile data usage compared to Fdroid. Also, not every app has dark mode, which is a standard feature on Fdroid. Because Google Play Store apps mostly are closed source, nobody can check on the app court for suspicious actions. Fdroid, on the other hand, only allows open source apps in its store. So everyone who understands code can check the app for privacy and security issues. Because the Google Play Store only allows one app of its kind, legacy apps don't exist. Legacy apps are apps that don't get updated anymore, so they still can be used on older devices. If there is a legacy version of the app, there also will exist a frequently updated version for recent devices. Another thing you won't find on the Google Play Store are alternative app stores. Google doesn't allow products to coexist with its services when they outperform them or could potentially become competitive products. This is different on Fdroid. Competition is wanted and a fair environment for the developers is guaranteed. Fdroid offers a variety of great apps for simple tasks, like note-taking, privacy-friendly fitness tracking or file management. But it also has more complex things like finance tools, cloud solutions for companies and educational apps. What they don't have are advanced and graphically stunning games. If you wanted to stop playing mobile games overall, this should not be a problem for you. But some things like mobile office programs still don't exist, which could be a compromise for you. On the Play Store it isn't possible to downgrade to an older app version. This can come in handy when the updated version appears to be buggy. On Fdroid you can downgrade to two app versions prior. Apps on the Fdroid Store mostly state more clearly which specific changes are made when they release a new update. However, on the Play Store there is a common practice that you write the user experience is being improved into your update description. This does not tell the user anything about what actually has been changed and how it affects him. Fdroid, on the other hand, does not offer age rating for apps, like the Play Store. But because age rating for apps often does not reflect reality well enough and people have accused Google in the past of using it as a tool to harm competitor apps, through higher age ratings this actually isn't a disadvantage. What Fdroid could add though as feature is a filter for child-only apps in order to be also attractive for families with younger kids. Now, is the Fdroid store an alternative to the Play Store? It isn't only an alternative. In many ways it outperforms the Play Store when it comes to useful features, transparency, security and privacy. The volunteers working on Fdroid accomplished that despite having limited resources compared to the Play Store which makes billions of US dollars each year. It seems like Google doesn't bother anymore to be attractive for users. They know how strongly people rely on their services. Fdroid contrarily to that consistently improves the Fdroid Store by for example partnering up with other privacy respecting organizations. Nonetheless you can't quit the Play Store completely. Official banking apps, school or work apps, government apps and office apps aren't supported. So my advice to you is replace as many Google Play Store apps with Fdroid apps that serve the same purpose. Ask yourself if you really need an app for every use case and if it isn't a good idea to scale down to the apps you really need on a regular basis. If you enjoyed this video a sub would be amazing. This way you won't miss out on the second Effort Explained episode where I will talk about common issues new users face when they are switching to the Effort store. You still have questions regarding Effort and the Google Play Store? You have ideas for future videos? You just want to say hello? Feel free to write something into the comments down below. And with that said, I wish you a great day and I hope to see you soon. Bye!